Andreas. Thank you, Rufo, for the introduction. Uh, my talk will go in a completely different direction. We are a funding mechanism. Uh, we are a private-public partnership. We have here also our uh, uh, sign uh, on the wall. Uh, and uh, our uh, concentration, our uh, m um, area of activity is um, embedded computing, including hardware and software, so electronic components and systems, basically embedded systems. And uh, that is also the motivation for my presentation. I was very pleased to see that in the introductory remarks, uh, for example, that uh, Rufo presented, uh, hardware and software had an almost equal uh, position. Uh, very quickly, however, the discussion goes in the direction of software only. And there are reasons for that. And I would like to try just to reestablish a little bit the importance of uh, not forgetting that uh, all the internet technology and all the information technology does not run, contrary to popular belief, on hot air. It runs on ships, and it runs on semiconductors, and it runs in routers, and it runs in hardware, and this is an important part of the whole system. So uh, that being said, uh, there are software and hardware threats. Um, the existence of uh, hardware threats is very well documented. Even a superficial check on internet finds numerous examples of hardware threats that have been identified. An example from two years ago, Cambridge found built-in vulnerabilities in chips themselves. The backdoors originated in manufacturing process at industry-leading suppliers, so going to renowned companies did not uh, eliminate the problem. Uh, these uh, threats permit attackers to disable security, monitor, modify information, and even permanently damage the device. So cybersecurity efforts have been focused on protecting against insider threats and vulnerabilities in software, but without addressing the foundational vulnerabilities in hardware and the supply chain behind it. Those security efforts amount to little more, let me quote that, little more than building castles on a foundation of sand. So you cannot secure by software a system that has built-in hardware vulnerabilities. It has to go both hands. It's after lineage technologies. As I said, every superficial check on internet discovers this kind of thoughts and this kind of example. Uh, building trust in the global technology supply chain is essential to increase trust. Now, let me stop a little bit here and mention the fact that in all, like in almost all human endeavors, there is no final, complete, ultimate solution. It's a process. Uh, threats are improving. Threats are getting more subtle, are getting more dangerous. And the responses are getting more sophisticated. And But we are not going to solve this kind of thing once for all. So we have to stay alert and we have to keep working on the subject. I'm quoting uh, Scott Chanick, who presented in the London uh, conference on 2011. And I'm quoting specifically Microsoft on that because he speaks about hardware and software. Now, Microsoft is, of course, uh, very strongly associated with software, although they had a small uh, adventure in building phones. But uh, except for that, uh, he is of the opinion that hardware and software today are composed by subcomponents from a range of supplies, and a, trustworth a trusted supply chain is essential to manage the risks. And I copy from his uh, presentation, from his synopsis, the fact that he looks at sourcing, making, and deploying the systems. And the threats happen in each of these steps. So it's not enough to look at deployment. Of course, the most publicized, the wider known examples are systems already deployed and a bunch of college students are hacking them. But that's not the whole story, of course, right? So we have to look at all steps in the, um, uh, in the value chain, in the manufacturing chain, and so conceptual design, manufacturing, and deployment. So looking at uh, software versus hardware vulnerabilities, a difference, malicious software can be created and disseminated by anyone with an internet connection. Hardware, malicious hardware, however, can be inserted only in the supply chain. Somebody, someone who has access and can alter a chip before it is placed in a finished product. So that is where we have to complement, actually, the efforts of vulnerability in deployment. Now, there are a lot of strategies that have been uh, mentioned for securing or increasing the security of hardware. As I said, I don't believe that 
final security solution exists, but we can improve step by step. Large amount of attention and resources are dedicated to software security, but countering malicious hardware is not quite that evolved, uh, not quite that far, although there are already quite a few ideas. I'm just mentioning a few of them here to show that it's not really new. People think about that already, design practices. So need to know partitioning, scrutiny of third party suppliers, control premises, use of trusted platform modules, which are also standardized by ISO, by IEC, and so forth. <coughs> Secure the supply chain, grading the participants in the supply chain. Also having strategies in fabrication that do not leave the whole uh, capability in one single uh, supplier or one hand. Uh, we need to have quick response on an attack. So a capability to preemptively uh, create uh, an entity maybe who can uh, coordinate, orchestrate the response in the case of discovering uh, such a threat. Having supplier databases, if there's a threat in a chip, to be able then to uh, identify any other application, users, uh, deployment uh, situations of that, and so forth. Testing procedures, able to detect corrupted chips. Now that is quite an ambitious goal, but however, there are possibilities to improve uh, in that direction. Uh, Built-in defenses, chip self-monitoring, identify, uh, able to identify attacks, put offending portion of the chip and quarantine, notifying devices having the same blocks and so forth. Uh, it's a whole uh, range of ideas, some of them easier to implement, some of them more difficult, some of them already there, some of them future uh, thinking and so forth. However, it's a topic that interests everybody. Now, the question that I'm going to uh, open here is, uh, looking at this uh, security aspect from the European perspective, uh, we consider that chip manufacturing in Europe, in particular for advanced devices, is lagging dramatically behind other regions of the world because of chronic underinvestment over a decade or more. If we look, for example, at the existing capacities in the world, we see that for 300 millimeter, which is the technology producing today, basically all advanced devices, in the last 15 years, basically, right? So everything that is blue are technologies older than 15 years, right? So all technologies that uh, use uh, what we can do since 15 years uh, uh, coming uh, nowadays uh, are split between Taiwan, Korea, Japan, uh, Americas, the United States, basically, some in the rest of the world, China getting in. Europe has altogether 7.4% of the capabilities and less than 3% on advanced technology. If we look at the investments in this area announced worldwide, future investments announced by the end of the last year, 17 billion in Taiwan, 14.7 in Korea, the same amount in USA. Japan doesn't invest, but Japan has a very strong uh, basis already. Japan is number two uh, altogether. And um, even the rest of the world, six billion. China, a very ambitious plan, 170 billion over the next five to 10 years. Obviously with uh, economical reasons, but maybe not exclusively economical. <laughs> for sure also sovereignty and autonomy and so forth. And Europe did not announce anything. We have a roadmap generated by the so-called electronic leaders group that says we shall support uh, demand on one side and uh, supply on the other, which is a good thought, but it's just a thought. And we talk about using European strategic investment funds. At the time I made this one, Juncker plan was not there. Uh, is Juncker plan usable for that? Maybe, a strong maybe. So uh, looking at all that, I will make a case and I will say that if Europe wants to have a credible position in defending uh, these, uh, these aspects of security in hardware, uh, we have to bite the bullet and put the investments on the table. And I anticipate that is going to happen under the pressure of an American living in Russia, of a Russian who lives in Russia, and other aspects that makes clear to us that we have a duty versus the European states and the European citizens. Uh, it's not a lot of money. People say, oh, it costs 10 to 15 billion euro. The numbers are correct, but this is not big money in the economy of things. Cost for defense, cost for security, cost for uh, even for um, developing agricultural aspects and defending the cotton production in Europe 
are in the same range of magnitude. So it's a matter of willing to do it. It's not a matter of being able to fund it. Now, there are also solutions that maybe uh, do not have to make the whole investments. This is an idea from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, for example, that manufacturing does not need to be done in one place, but you can split manufacturing. You can have manufacturing that done partially, oh, I put a different guy, right? partially in a less trusted fab, in an untrusted fab, but then, for example, the connectivity, the connection, can be done in a tighter control environment. As we said, this is one of the basic principles, splitting the responsibilities, securing only the aspects that are really critical, and so forth. Now, just a few slides to understand what we do. So we are uh, basically uh, busy on electronic components and systems that provide the smart of everything. So anytime you put the word smart in front of something, means that you put our products inside that something. We are a public-private partnership established by the Council Regulation. Excel started in June 2014 and uh, will continue under Horizon 2020. Uh, we have the funding uh, from uh, in the form of an autonomous body. So we are an organization on our own registered in the Register of Commerce in Brussels. Uh, we actually uh, manage a total cost in the range of 5 billion euro. The members are the European Union, uh, who put 1.2 billion roughly, expect about the same amount from the member states, and then uh, with the private contributions, we will come to the total amount. Uh, let me underline that the number that is in the presentation only sees commission contribution last year. Uh, the story doesn't start with the commission, doesn't end with the commission, or maybe starts with, but doesn't end with the commission. We have other contributions in that. Last year, we started projects in with a total value above 700 million euro that we manage. Uh, it's the, the only organization with three ways funding. So we have European funding, we have national funding, and of course, private sector funding. And uh, we have only one mechanism, launching call for proposals, selecting pro uh, projects, and funding. So. We only have a hammer. If you can make your idea look like a nail, we can hit it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way it goes. However, this mechanism is of incredible flexibility. We have, just to quote that and refer to a slide by Mr. Siebert, who showed Galileo. Galileo has a regulatory obligation to have European suppliers for <coughs> encryption chips. Encryption chips are built on field programmable data arrays mostly. So chips are generically uh, designed and built. Then they are uh, customized in the usage. And uh, we have a project that has been submitted, coordinated by the European Defense Agency, European Space Agency together. But it was a regular project submitted to our call, was a good project, has been selected for funding. And we have good hope that through this project, we are going to fulfill a fundamental need of hardware security for the Galileo satellites. So we can use existing instruments. We did not exploit completely the existing flexibilities in what we have. We can use that. And just to close that, European government visionary roles. We have here a quote from last year, from March last year, of uh, Chancellor Merkel, who gave a press conference together with Mr. Barroso after they visited some semiconductor facility in Germany. She says, that 10 years ago, heads of state were not interested in internet companies and router manufacturers. I have also a photo of her with a phone in the hand, and you can understand some aspects of the interest that she got in the topic. But now we must act, said she. In the future, chip production will match with the software production. Software and hardware belong together. And then she said, we cannot expect that a few software companies that we, Europeans, still have We'll implement solutions on the chips we buy. Chips and software grow together. And let me point out on that. People say, we secure uh, European citizens by making secure apps on iPhone. Really? Who built the iPhone? What is in it? <laughs> Are you really securing by just building secure apps? Chips and software grow together. We have to keep that in mind. We have the communication of the Commission, so at the European level, the awareness is also there. Europe must be able to decide and act depend without depending on capabilities of third parties, so have some autonomy, some aspects under control, maybe not everything, but define what the criticals are, and beat the bullet, invest, 
finance what you just studied that helped them even present it and make sure that you have that uh, fulfilled. Thank you very much.